parents, people who aren't yet married, um, and all of these different things, people who are even, even people who are, you know, have challenging situations around uh, the topic of father, and, and then to actually be able to come and, and still honour dads with, with, all, like, with all of that tension, I just, I, I just love it. I don't know, sometimes, I don't know, I just enjoy the pressure, I think. <laughs> but um, what we were talking about this morning is uh, fishing. Do we have the t- Gorn fishing? That would make a good bumper sticker. You should get that for my car. Go on fishing. Um, and, and really what I want to talk about this morning is that sometimes Jesus tells you to do stuff. Sometimes Jesus tells you to do stuff. And sometimes it's to go fishing. I like it when he says that. But, uh, but and, and anyway, you, you'll see where the, where, the title, where the sermon's got its title from. We're starting with Luke chapter 5. And I'm going to read from verse uh, 1. And Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. Uh, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, belonging to the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch simon answered master we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything but because you say so i will let down let down the nets when they had done so they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break so they signaled to the partners in in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink when simon peter saw this he fell at Jesus. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, "Go away from me, Lord! I am a sinful man." For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to him, "Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people." So they pulled, uh, they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on there. It starts with these career fishermen. They are they've been they know their business. They they know what they're doing. Jesus comes along and to really sort of get it, Jesus was 30 years old, which in that culture was we we look at and my nephew turned 21 this week and we look at that as that's your manhood. In this culture 30 it was is your man. You actually weren't allowed to read the Song of Solomon until you were 30. Just just for so you know. <laughs> that that's and so jesus wasn't like this uh revered sort of respected up like he was a younger guy and he's come to these guys and he's uh, obviously he's got a little bit of notoriety because there are people that are around and there are people listening to him so he's got a little bit of sort of some followers if he had instagram or the friends on the facebook um but he he's he's he hasn't done anything amazing yet he, he he's not been uh, raising the dead and doing all the stuff that we know jesus is famous for we so he at this time he's just a guy with a little bit of a reputation and he says to peter he says hey can i use your boat and peter's like yeah cool why not um and then at once he's finished he says to peter he says throw your net out in the deep now a whole bunch of stuff from what i understand that isn't the right place to cast your net in the first place it's the wrong time of day but more than this peter's tired man and and, and they're fixing their nets, they're cleaning their nets. So what this is akin to, it's, they're packing up. It, they're hard work cleaning, washing your gear, sorting it all out, putting it away. And Jesus is saying, hey, undo all your hard work. Go and get it wet again. And he's like, man, I am tired enough. I was out here all night. We didn't catch anything. Now I've cleaned my gear. I'm ready to call it a day. But then is there somewhere in there, somewhere, he's like, he recognizes there's something special about this guy. He doesn't know what, but he recognizes there's something special. And he says, because you say so, I'll do it. And then he goes out, does it all wrong, and gets this amazing catch. Then he comes back, and, and, he's, and his response is, is, he says, Jesus, get away from me. Get, get away from me. And we, we might look at that as some sort of 
I don't know, euphemism or some sort of just saying they had back then, but I don't believe it's the case. I think Peter was so aware of his inadequacy, so aware of who he was as a man, that when he was confronted with, you've got to understand, we're in a Pentecostal church, we see miracles, experience miracles, hear about miracles, we've got the Bible, which has got a tremendous record of miracles. They had been no prophet active in this area for 400 years. Nothing amazing was happening. And you want to put context 400 years. Australia was colonized 200 years ago. The United States was colonized 400 years ago. We're talking about the time of the pilgrims to now. Nothing. No supernatural. No anything. And then all of a sudden, this guy who knows his stuff. See, to you and I, oh yeah, you caught lots of fish, goody. <laughs> but if it's in your trade, if it's in your area of... Uh, understanding so okay for us I'm not a school teacher and if I see like you know the kid that never gets makes good grades struggles with his stuff all the time he comes in and makes an A plus I'm like yeah good on you man but the teacher that's worked with him knows that is crazy something full-on just happened there we have people who uh, Pastor Malcolm runs Teen Challenge and, and we see people go into Teen Challenge and, and we might hear, oh, this person was a really bad drug addict person, la, la, la. Now look at them. Praise God, they're living this amazing life. Except like Melissa with talking about Frank earlier, her stepdad, he knew her back then. So when he sees her now and sees her then, it's not, oh, praise God, isn't that wonderful? It's, oh, my goodness. The, uh, because it's in his wheelhouse. He understands it. So Peter is dealing with something in his wheelhouse that is like, he knows there's no fish there. He knows how you catch fish and it's not like that. And then Jesus just breaks all the rules and totally smashes open every, and he just invades 400 years of silence from God. Apart from the, uh, the prophet John who had just been there and he didn't do any amazing miracles. He was just saying, hey, someone's coming. And then, th then all of a sudden this guy comes and does something radical like this. And Peter is so exposed. He's like, get away from me. He's not being polite. He's freaked out. He's freaked out. You've really got to understand the context of what these guys are talking about. If they were exposed to proper holiness, they would die. The temple system, there was actually barriers because if you cross that line, holiness is on the other side. If you go over there, you will die. And, and he's freaked out. You ever been freaked out before? Something weird happens and you're just freaked out. This is like that, except he thinks he's going to die. And then Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. He says, don't be afraid. I love that the, the passion puts it like this. It says, don't yield to your fear. Simon Peter saw this. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And I love this. So they pulled up their nets, their boats left everything his mates knew what time it was as well these are also fishermen they knew exactly they, they were just as freaked out as peter they're like you call me i'm coming <laughs> how much of it was because they just wanted to follow him how much of it was because they were terrified i don't know probably a little from column a a little from column b but what and this is what i'm wanting this is this is the thrust of what i want to say this morning is jesus called them to do a thing to do an action called one guy to do an action that action led to the next thing where Jesus called him to change the direction of his life. First thing was go fishing, do it this way instead of that way. Just a thing, go fishing. The next thing, Jesus says, I want you to change the direction of your life. Just destiny in your heart. Boom, his entire life is transformed. The direction of his life is catapult. He was expecting to be a fisherman for the rest of his life. Now he's left his boat. He's following Jesus. And this is what... God wants to do with you. Almost can't help but wondering if when Peter said, go away, there was a sense that there was more going on here. There was a sense that this holy man was going to require something of him. There was a sense that this holy man was actually going to interfere with his life. 
more than being afraid for his life, more than being freaked out by this supernatural experience, I can't help but wonder if Peter had an awareness that this is the guy that was going to answer the longing he had in his heart his whole life. This sense in his heart that his life was meant for more than this. This sense in his heart that he wasn't supposed to just fish for his whole life. This understanding that I'm not just one guy doing one thing. I feel like I've got so much more in me. I wonder if at that point, when Jesus has done this crazy thing, and says, uh, 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 this guy, I wonder if he knows at that point, oh my goodness, this is the one. This is the one. And, and, and then... Uh, <laughs> And Jesus, he tells Jesus to go away, and Jesus says no. Jesus says no. Jesus says, I'm not going to let you get in the way of your destiny. Isn't that refreshing? You can't get in the way of your destiny. And Jesus won't give up on you that quick. But what if Peter didn't follow him? What if Peter didn't follow him? The rest of the Gospels, Peter is a main feature. He's one of the main guys that we read about, we hear about. You know, there's so many of Jesus' really special moments Peter was a part of. We read about Peter's spectacular failure. We read about Peter in the book of Acts, preaching the first spirit-filled message in the New Testament. The first converts ever made by anyone other than Christ himself it, into the New Covenant was Peter. What would have happened if he said no? What would have happened if he stayed, but his mates saw the miracle and they responded? And this is what I want to challenge you with. Jesus said, don't be afraid, or as a passion put it so well, don't yield to your fear. So this is more than him being, oh my goodness, that's freaky. No, so saying don't yield to your fear. It means don't shrink back at a time when you're called to step forward. Now I want to talk, read, read, read you a, the, the, tell, I'll tell and read. There's, a lot of us will know the story about King David, an amazing, amazing uh, hero of faith in the Bible. Um, did some cool stuff, did some not so cool stuff, had some kids. One of his kids succeeded him as king. This kid, this king now rather, God blessed him more than any person has ever been, had a physical manifestation of blessing in history before or since. And, 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 but God put some criteria on, on, on the kingship and he said, don't serve other gods, um, a few other things. But this guy, even though God was amazing to him, he, he went off and served other gods. And, and there was a consequence for that, was that his son was not going to be able to rule like he ruled. And in fact, he was only going to get one tribe of the, there was 12, 12 sections, states if you like, if you want to put it in sort of similar context to ours. And, and he's, you're going to get one. And, and he called this guy Jeroboam. To, and and this, a prophet came to Jeroboam, and, and I'm going to read what the prophet said to Jeroboam. He's just told him what's happened. He said, Solomon's been dodgy before God. God can't, he's done. Uh, I, I'm going to separate him. He's going to get one tribe. His kids are going to get one tribe. I'm going to give you the rest. And I'll, we just pick up from, from there. However, for you, as for you, I will take you, and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command you and walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands as David, my servant, did, I'll be with you. And this is the kicker right here. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. So this guy has a prophetic word from God, the destiny call in his heart, if you like. That he is going to be king over everything. He, he's, everything he can ever hope for, God said, I'll do that. He says, I'll build you a dynasty. And what is a dynasty? It's, it, that means generations, generations and generations. We, we read about the Chinese dynasties. They went for a thousand years. One line of family, just son after son after son. And, just, just, and, and God says, hey, I want to do this for you. And then time came where God did actually give him the kingdom and, and separated. There was only one kingdom, one, one tribe left, and the, the priests actually went over as well. So he ended up getting two tribes, um, Solomon's son. 
And this guy had 10 tribes. Problem was, is that the church was over at the other guy's state, tribe section, Jerusalem. And he's got his word from God, says, do everything my way and it'll be cool dynasty. Unending line of kings coming from you. But he used his head. He's almost like, think of Peter when Jesus said, cast out in the deep. Peter had the opportunity to use his fishing head and his experience and his knowledge and say, hang on, that's not how we do it. I'll chuck it out where I know. This guy used his political nous and said, well, hang on. Politically, that's not a good move to have people going to church to do the worship that they need to do over there because what's going to happen is they're actually going to go back to the line of David and they're going to have him as their king and they're going to leave me. Even though God said, if I do it his way, he'll give me a dynasty. God, great God and all, is not really into politics. Doesn't know much about the political system. Doesn't know much about how you play the game. What we're going to do is I've got a better way. I'll set up a couple of idols, golden cows. You know, that's pretty pretty big hook. Gonna love me a golden cow. And and get the people to go to church there and worship the instead of going over there because it's politically stupid. And and long 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 story short. I'll read it word for word. First Kings uh, 12, 26. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will likely revert to David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to the Lord, Rehoboam to their Lord, little L, talking about the king, Rehoboam, which is Solomon's son, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. So this guy threw away his dynasty because of fear. Because of fear. Jesus' words to Peter was, don't yield to your fear. So what have we got here? We've got a word from God, common sense, logic. I mean, I'm all for wisdom, I'm all for logic, but when it contradicts the word of God, the systems are clashing. And we have, we have some decisions to make. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6, it says, Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, submit to God, know God. Uh, lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, submit to God. It's a clash of systems, and we're at the point where what are we going to choose? What are we, what are we going to choose? What are you going to choose? You know, God has a plan for your life. God has an amazing plan for your life. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord. Uh, plans, to, uh, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in the future. Psalm, tw- uh, Psalm 139, 16 says, Your eyes f- saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. It's a clash of systems. The world actually tells you you've got no reason. You came here by chance. A monkey crawled out of the ooze, fell out of a tree, and that's your great uncle. And when you die, you go back to the dust, done. That, that's, that's the world system that we live in. That's how it describes it. But the scripture says that I formed you in your mother's womb. I saw every day you had. And we're at this point where it's like, okay. I have a purpose. And when God interrupts you, it's not going to be a big, come and follow me. It's going to be, hey, cast your net over there. And then as you're over there doing it, then he's going to say, come and follow me. And then then we're going to be confronted with the systems. And I'll tell you one thing. God is not good at politics. God is not even good at ministry. God is not good at not the way we look at it because our standard is too low and and uh, so from uh, when i came to god i was at teen challenge drug rehabilitation center flat out junkie no hope nothing i lost everything had nothing and then i gave it all to god it's not hard to do when you got nothing 
And then at that point, God met me and I really felt him put purpose in my heart. And I went, no, 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 no. I retract that. He awakened a purpose in my heart. You see, before that, I remember such an awareness that God had a plan for my life. Not that God had a plan for I wouldn't have put it like that, but that I was meant for something. That my life somehow was supposed to matter. That my life was somehow in the ethereal something of it all was supposed to be bigger than just me. And I just knew it. And I remember being so trapped and so stuck, thinking, how on earth can I get from just me, this derelict junkie, to somebody whose life is supposed to affect nations, it's supposed to make a difference. And and and, and then when I came to came to God, God woke that up in me. And he clearly spoke to me and he said, I want you to, I call you to preach the gospel to the nations. And I knew from this brand new believer or just starting my journey again, knowing that I was supposed to do something significant for God, that I was supposed to ripple through time, changing lives that would change lives. And I knew this. I had my plan, my word from God. My plan. So I wrote down my plan, which was finish the Teen Challenge project program, get my certificate, my medal. It's quite shiny. Then I would go to Bible college, study to do Bible college, go to a good church, the right church with the right connections, join the team as a youth leader, go from youth leader to youth pastor. Then I'd move to the pastor and then I would get, well, and then I'll start to preach and then I'd go all over the world. And then God said, hey, come and work at the rehab. I'm like, God, don't you know the plan? Two years I worked there. Great season, all of that. This whole time I'm thinking, I just had to let go of the plan. I'm like, well, there's the plan. And all this time I'm learning, because the scripture says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, know God, acknowledge God. And I'm learning God. I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, that word, know God, acknowledge God, submit to God. The word. It's actually the same word used that Adam knew Eve. It's talking about a deep intimacy, a soul-to-soul -soul connection. And, and during that journey, I started to know God. And I was able to let go of my way, which was good, because then God called me out of helping people. It was a Christian, a Christian rehab, so I was even getting to preach the gospel to about sometimes up to 20 drug addicts at a time. It wasn't the nations, but at least I'm preaching the gospel. At least I'm on my way. I can sort of see it. And then God calls me out to go and work in a warehouse. I think I spoke about this the other day. Punching bars. A monkey could do it. Just machine. And then I got promoted to delivering beds. A stronger monkey could have done it. And then and this went on for a couple of years. And I'm like, God, I'm starting to drown at this point. Because the call on me is so strong. And I haven't let go of the call. I'm like, God, you've got the call in my heart, but the instruction is going the wrong way. And then one day I get a phone call from Pastor Malcolm. I remember I was in my uh, blue hard yakka singlet with my blue shorts and my steel cap boots. And I get a call from Malcolm and Malcolm said, hey, Jacob, uh, the pastor's moving off to the mission field. Would you like to come and pastor the church? I'm like, yes. Didn't need to pray about that one. <laughs> Just done. <laughs> When do I start? <laughs> Just leave my truck and follow you. <laughs> and and that's cool. And I and I start and I and I go on this journey, which was an amazing journey, like ten years of pastoring this church. And then then I feel God call me out again. And I'm like, okay. And I'm talking to Malcolm and Melissa, and we're like, okay, God. And I'm just like, this is so crazy. I I think I'm losing my mind. Surely God's not. That doesn't make any sense. And Malcolm's like, Jake, you. You can see the event. It's a, God's calling you into evangelism. And I'm like, okay, well, at least that's on the track, on the trajectory. Preach your gospel to the nations. Awesome. I'm like, ooh, terrified. And then, like, so I, so I step off out of my staff position at church. I'm still here. I'm still working, but just for free. <laughs> and, and then... Then, then, then God just put such a strong word on me. He wants me to start to speak to school kids about drugs. I'm like, God, don't you know the plan? And he was so strong. And I was just like, all right, thank you, Lord. And I just focused on, and, and, and I'm just, this God doesn't know the way. 
and like what he does and his way is different to our way. But because I've got to know him, I know that when he says cast your net over there, he just wants to get you over there. When you're over there, then he can get you and point you in the direction he wants you to go. So he's put you <laughs> So things are going great. I can start to see a few doors are opening and then COVID hits. And we're like, oh my goodness. Now, I don't even get to preach in my own church. We start to go and preach to a camera and praise God, it actually went pretty well. But then, but then we're just looking at this God. He, he, he keeps calling us to stuff that doesn't make sense. And we've got to decide whether we're going to do it or not. And then more recently, then very recently, I was sitting right there and Melissa's preaching a message and then God said to me, oh, I think she said something about, right, you need to pray and God's going to put something on your heart about something. And then God said, get a job. I'm like, God, I have a job. I'm doing these things and it's, uh, and then I felt like God say, no, go look for a job. And I'm like, and I was all fired up, heard from Lord. Yeah, I'm, I'm crazy for God. I'll step out and do it. And I said to Mel, I don't care. Yeah, God said it. I'll go get a job at Subway if I have to. I don't care. And then that sort of shine wore off a little bit, but I'd already applied for a bunch of jobs. And I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then I'm not hearing back from any. And then and I was like, uh, are you going to apply for any more? And I was just so strongly felt God saying, no, that's it, done. I'm like, but God, I'm hearing all these no, no, no's. And then I just get this just perfect job. It, it's working in mental health. And, but it's just around the corner. I get to pick the hours, all of these sorts of things. It's just like... <laughs> okay, how is this not God? All right, God. He's saying, hey, cast your net over there. I say, it makes no sense. Don't you know the plan? And, and God doesn't seem to care about the plan. He just doesn't care about the plan because he's the one who said, I call you to preach to the nations. He's the one who said to Peter, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. So then through Peter's journey, for those, some of us will know, Peter actually bombed it pretty bad right toward the end. So Jesus is on his way to the cross and Peter's like, yeah, forget you. <laughs> nah, Jesus, who's that? No, 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 don't know no Jesus is. No, no, never met the guy. <laughs> and then turned, turned away, Jesus, his Lord, his best friend, his saviour's most, his time of need, and, and he left him. And he was just racked with guilt and but then Jesus, he said, I forgive you. He said, tell Peter and the disciples that I'm alive. But then we move back to fishing. So we're fishing on, fishing on, finishing on fishing. Because we're at this point where Peter is bombed it about as badly as he could. He's stuffed up. He had his call from God. He stepped out in faith. He followed God. He saw amazing things. He saw the trajectory of his life. He saw the, the thing waking up in his heart. And then he blew it. He blew it. And then he said, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to what I know. And we, we pick it up at John chapter 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana, all these guys were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. Some theologians actually think that means Peter said, I'm going back to fishing. I'm, I'm going back to being a fisherman. We'll go with you, they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat. That night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, some coals of fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter, can I get their ushers to bring around the, uh, oh, everyone's got their communion. This is awesome system. 
Uh, so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. Side note, John actually goes on at the end of this book and says, hey, I would write to, I need to write more, but there's not enough room here. So, but he leaves some key details in, 153 fish. He was proud of his haul. He's like, beat that. But even with so, so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now, this was the third time he'd, jumping down to verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Imagine by that third time, Peter's talking to the greatest prophet to ever walk the earth. The, the one he knows is God incarnate. And it's, he's getting the feeling like he doesn't believe him. He's like, but I, I don't have anything left. All I've got is the call you've put on my life. <laughs> There's a moment here where it's like he's got nothing. He's got everything or nothing. And it seems like it's nothing. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went from where you wanted but when you are old, you stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said, to this, said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. <laughs> Jesus called Peter. He said, chuck your net over there. Peter did it. Comes back and Jesus says, follow me. Peter's blown it. Tragically, he's just blown it. But the way Jesus calls him back, he says, chuck your net over there. <laughs> he, he does. And then he says, follow me. We've got to interact with the things God says to us. They might not make sense. They might not make sense to our brain in our human thinking. But the scripture says that my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than yours. We've got to trust that God knows Ephesians 1 4 says this for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and then in the very next chapter it says for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do it says God knew you before the foundation of the world and he planned good things for you to do not for someone else to do that you can do if you want to for you I knew you and I planned things for you I've what is he saying? He says, I've got a destiny for your life. You were created with a purpose. For a reason. Intentionally. To achieve things that I've put before you. That only you can do. Because I made them for you to do. We're just going to take communion right now. And some of us... I believe are at a point where Jesus is saying to you, cast your net on the right side of the boat when it makes no sense to you. Some of you are at a point where you have worked all night, you're tired. You've done everything you know to do with no results. And Jesus is saying, throw your net on the right side. Some of you are devastated because of time. Time has passed. And outcomes that you know God promised you are not come to pass. And again, you hear in the voice, you hear the same voice as throw your net on the right side of the boat. Some of you have done that already, and you've got another voice that's saying, Follow me. Follow me. And we've got a decision to make. I believe that this is an opportunity right now. I think there's a season of grace, a window of grace. 
on this Father's Day where we not just celebrate the dads in our lives, but we honour the Father of all. Abba. Where we just say yes, Dad. It's time to say yes. It's time to stop trying to figure it all out. And actually... Just believe that our dad knows more than we do. I'm going to pray and then I want you to take your communion and you just do business with God. Heavenly Father, we love you with all of our hearts. <laughs> like the Apostle Peter, we, we say, you know that we love you, God. We wouldn't be here on a Sunday morning if we didn't love you. We wouldn't serve like we do if we didn't love you. We wouldn't give like we do if we didn't love you we wouldn't give you our lives the way we have if we didn't love you Lord we make the decision this morning to not lean on our own understanding but in all of our ways we trust you, we acknowledge you, we know you we submit to you and we just say yes Lord whether you're calling us to cast whether you're calling us to follow, our answer is yes. And just while we're in this attitude of prayer, I believe that some people have been called to follow. And maybe for the very first time, or maybe you've not followed, you've followed Jesus a long time ago and you've walked away. And this is your time to come home. Like the Apostle Peter is saying, follow. Maybe not for the first time, maybe for the second time. Maybe for the 14th time. And this is your chance to respond. And if you've never made that decision or you, you're not walking with God right now and he's, call, he's calling you to follow. And if you want to take that step and follow, I invite you to make that decision right now. As a church, we're going to pray. And if you're online, I invite you to join us. I'm just going to lead us in prayer. I'm going to ask that you just repeat what I say. And if you're making that decision to follow for the first time, as you pray, just mean it with all your heart. Oh, repeat after me, church. Dear God, I choose to follow you. I choose to put you first in my life. Please forgive me for living life my own way. Give me the grace to live the life you called me to. From today forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we believe you just got born again. And God has an amazing future for you. This is day one. Get connected into a good church if you're online. Get in touch with us. We'll help you get, get uh, on your way. If you're here for, and you pray that for the first time, I'd love to pray with you. God's got an amazing future. Amen. Let's just take our communion. Just while we're taking it, I'm going to pray. The Lord Jesus said, this is my body that was broken for you. That sacrifice purchased everything we need in life. Our healing, physically, emotionally, mentally. Our provision. The blood was shed for the remission of sin, for the forgiveness of sin. It washes us clean. Thank you for the cross, Lord. You're so amazing in our life. Thank you, Jesus.